Hey everybody and welcome back to the History Reader. It's been a little bit since I did a video, um, basically because my reading has been all over the place and I haven't had a cohesive kind of video idea for a little bit. Um, it's really easy to go out and buy a ton of books and then like do a book haul. Um, but we, uh, I've kind of got back into the swing of things a little bit so I thought I would do a video about the stuff I've been reading recently. And like two or three videos ago, I did one about like what I'm planning to read. And in that one, I said, I don't usually set TBRs because like monthly TBRs, because I just don't get around to reading the books. Um, because either I like find other books, um, like buy other books or some book like comes up as a recommendation. And I like have to read it now, or just that I get interested in a particular topic and want to go read books about that and the books that I've got on my like TBR aren't on that topic um, and that's exactly what's happened this time so I can't remember if I gave a review of War Beneath the Sea uh, by Peter Padfield this is the one that I was reading um, when I did the last uh, TBR and it is about submarine warfare in the Second World War um, and it is really really well written, fascinating, well researched. Um, it basically looks at the major navies with submarines being obviously Germany, uh, the US, the, the um, UK, Italy to some minor extent and Japan and looking at the different theories behind like how they wanted to use submarines, how that impacted the design of the submarines that they um, built and the training and also then how they developed their tactics over the course of the war um, looking at technical things that were going wrong like torpedoes not exploding or tracking too low or whatever and how that affected warfare um, so as a self-contained book it was really excellent it's about 500 pages um, it's also got a really awesome appendix or set of appendices with different notes and um, diagrams and things like that so that's really cool um, I really really enjoyed that one um, and I would recommend to anyone interested in the topic so that's where I got uh, slightly sidetracked um, this actually started in sort of November December time when I read a book on Scott of the Antarctic um, really got interested in that like exploring idea um, I have another book, I don't know exactly where it is, um, I'll see if I can spot it. No, probably not going to happen. Um, I've got another book on that sort of golden age of exploring which I've read previously as well. Um, but I picked up um, some other ones and this is where I've really started enjoying audiobooks again because this topic um, Exploring and particularly Everest is what I've got into is really great for um, audiobooks. They're simple enough um, and the, yeah, the, the stories are simple enough and the source material is small enough that the books that get written about it are quite easy to digest in audiobook form. So I read Into Thin Air again, um, that's by John Krakow. I read this early on in 2021 and then um, I thought I'd come back to it. It's a really short little book um, about the 1996 Everest disaster. Um, then I picked up also an audiobook, Everest 1953 by Mick Conifery, um, and that is about the first ascent of Everest. But he does it really well in that he looks at the history of Everest, it being discovered as being the tallest mountain in the world by um, the. I, believe it's called the Great Geographical Survey or something like that. Um, Great Trigonometrical Survey, that's it. Um, so where they basically, they tried to um, figure out the sort of curvature of the earth by measuring the distance from the bottom to the top of India um, and then figuring out like from the prediction of how far that would be according to the models, how different it was, they could figure out the diameter of the earth which they got pretty close to um, and the guy who led it was a guy called George Everest um, who they then ended up 
on that expedition, they measured the height of this peak that they found, which they figured out was the highest peak um, in the world, highest mountain. The local name, there's a couple of local names. The one that's most commonly referenced is Chumolongma, um, which effectively, um, I think it's Tibetan, or Tibetan or Nepali, um, and it translates effectively to like Mother of the Earth or something similar to that. Um, normally they would keep the local names for the peaks, but for some reason, them being the British, um, decided to call it, name it after George Everest, and then it got bastardized into Everest. So yeah, it tells the story of that, and then also tells the various stories of how they attempted to climb Everest and some of the technological and physiological challenge associated with that. The things like um, the like oxygen that's required, um, various technical aspects of like the f actually figuring out a route, um, and then in 1953 the climb actually being successful. But there's a bunch of political stuff in there. Um, access to Everest was not so easy. You either have to go through Tibet or Nepal. Both of those were closed off and opened and closed depending on um, political spats that happened. Um, the wars, First World War and Second World War also interrupted the attempts. And so eventually in 1953 it was climbed by a team, um, a British team, uh, with the um, summer party being made up of Edmund Hillary and Tenzing Norgay. Um, so it basically tells that story. It's really, really well done, really interesting book. Um, I enjoyed it so much I picked up another one of Mick Conifree's books called Ghosts of K2, which um, is about the second highest peak in the world. Um, and it's the same thing. It's telling the history of discovering K2 and then the attempts to climb it and eventually the first ascent. Um, so those are the audiobooks that I've been listening to on the topic. Um, I've also been reading some books about the topic. Um, one of them being Edmund Hillary, a biography by Michael Gill. This is a fairly recent uh, book, I believe. Um, it was published in um, 2017. Michael Gill knew Edmund Hillary personally and climbed with him, I believe, on some expeditions. Um, and so he's, he's written this book. Um, and so far I am really enjoying it. The source material for people like this is quite small, particularly um, like Edmund Hillary is known for climbing Everest for the first time, but he was quite a reserved private guy. Um, he was a beekeeper in New Zealand. And so he has this like one event in his life, which is very, very well documented. And then later things in his life, which are documented to a much lesser extent. Um, and so it's really interesting to see how Gil is managing that. Um, he's, in the last couple of chapters, actually looked at some of the history of Everest as well, um, and some of the politics around. Um, the really interesting thing about this is that because they're national efforts, particularly British national efforts, they have like effectively government funding to do this. Um, and so there's politics involved in who gets selected for the team and leads it and all this stuff. So that's one I've been reading. I've also got one on my Kindle because I haven't been able to find a physical copy of it yet. Um, and that is The Third Poll by Mark Sinnott. Um, and I actually watched as a documentary about his expedition to Everest. The story of Everest is really interesting because in 19, um, in the 20s they tried to climb it. And there was a British expedition led by uh, George Mallory and Sandy, well, not led by, but George Mallory and Sandy Irvine were potentially the first people to reach the summit of Everest. They died before getting down if they did get up there, but we don't know. What we do know is that they got close. Um, and it's kind of just shrouded in mystery. Like nobody's been able to figure it out. There's George Mallory's body was found in the 90s, sort of, it, it had clearly fallen from somewhere near, like on the ridge that goes up to the summit. It had fallen and an ice axe was also found. Um, 
it's known that they took a camera with them and Sandy Irvine probably had the camera. If they can find the camera, then they'll be able to see if they made it to the summit. Now obviously, it opens up all the like, um, who gets the credit for reaching the summit first? Getting up and down safely is the goal. Edmund, Hillary and Tenzing Norgate did that first, but it would be really um, groundbreaking if they were able to find the camera. In that book by Mark, Mark Sinnott, they, have, they do an expedition to go and find, they think they know where Sandy Irvine's body is, um, and they go to try and find it. I know the ending um, because I've watched a documentary about it, that they don't actually find the body. Um, but the book is really interesting because it contrasts, um, because he goes on an expedition himself, and is so, but he's wrapped up in the history of climbing Everest, you get a really nice contrast of what it was like to climb Everest back in the 20s and in the 50s, and then what it's like to climb now and how things have changed. Um, so that's really interesting, um, I'm reading that one alongside the Hillary one. And then there's a couple others that I've found that I want to read on the topic as well. So that's everything um, that I've been reading at the moment. Obviously you can see things have switched a bit, new boats to Everest, but uh, I've been having a lot of fun with that. Um, hope you've been having fun with what you've been reading. I'll see you in the next video. Bye.